What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Adventures in DevOps. And we have quite the studio going on today. Joining me, as always, Jonathan Hall. Hey. Welcome, Jonathan. And in addition to a live studio audience today, we have joining us the Chief Evangelist from Incredibuild, Dory Extraman. Welcome, Dory. Thanks. Thanks for having me. No, it's a pleasure to have you. I'm actually looking forward to this topic. We are going to be talking today about the gaming industry, which is something we haven't covered on our podcast before. But uh, before we dive into that, Dory, you want to give us a little bit about your background and what you do? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, I'm in the software industry for almost 30 years now. Uh, uh, start, you know, always uh, kind of PC, uh, many different kind of software, consulted to a lot of organizations uh, in a variety of technological uh, and architectural kind of new stuff. Uh, do, I'm doing a lot of uh, 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 talks in, in conferences, in podcasts such as this, uh, working a lot with uh, incredible uh, marketing, technology, strategy, all this kind of where, where technology meets business, meets go-to-market. That's where I find myself, you know, most, you know, enjoying the most. Um, yeah, the software industry, it's really exciting. I really like, you know, what I'm doing. The customers that I'm speaking with uh, will speak more about it, so I'll be able to share more. Uh, yeah, that's more or less. Right on, cool. And, and now we were just talking about this before we started recording the podcast, that your role as chief evangelist is has moved you from being oriented towards the technical teams to more customer oriented, right? Yeah, yeah. I've been at Incredibuild for, for many years as CTO, managing uh, the R&D, also the product of Incredibuild, taking it you know, to, uh, from a small, relatively small startup to, to the size that we are today, serving you know, a very large portion of the expert pro kind of uh, developers in the world today, leading the, the software development ecosystem. And uh, after many years of as CTO in Credibuild, uh, I think that I understood that what I like most is, is where technology meets business, meets go-to-market, you know, being more close to the customer, to the way that we want to kind of uh, have Incredibuild out there, bringing all the data back to the organization, uh that, that's the fun part that's what i like to do most and that's where i'm what i'm doing today right on so i have actually no experience or even any idea of what the devops processes for publishing a game looks like but i can imagine it's pretty competitive and high pressured so walk us through what that what that kind of looks like uh, actually, it's it's very complex. Uh, you know, the the pipeline is 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 much more complex than the regular software development pipeline because there are more more things. You know, more things to a game than just uh, code. You have all the assets, all the graphics. Uh, you have multiple phases as part of your process. You know, there are things that needs to be rendered. There are things that needs to be compressed. Uh, there are, there are, and that's beside all the software kind of usual stack of, of compiling your code, running your unit test, integration test, API, sanity, whatever, code analysis. But you have all these other stuff that are specifically related to games as well. Uh, it's a highly competitive market. So, you know, the need for speed is, is in the bone and marrow of this industry. Uh, it's also a very, a very tech-oriented industry, uh, very adaptive to new technologies. Uh, I think that's, that's one of the reasons that uh, Incredible grew so fast in this industry because people are keen to try out new technologies that uh, bring them productivity. Uh, I think that when, when, when one of the things that categorize uh, CI, CD, DevOps pipelines, you know, of games, Game Studios is that I think competitiveness is, is, is something that's 
in the DNA of, of these studios. You know, they, they must release on time. Uh, if you want to meet your Christmas deadline, then it has, you know, uh, harsh implications on your game sales because, you know, people are waiting to buy that for Christmas. Yeah. Release one month after, uh, later, and, you know, you're, you're kind of stuck with, with, with projections that are not meeting expectations. Uh, and this is one of the reasons that uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the crunch time, kind of crunch time, uh, notorious culture in the gaming industry where, you know, before releases, bring your sleeping bag to the office, uh, <laughs> everyone's staying, you know, weekends, etc. So people are trying to avoid that. And that's, that's you know, that puts a lot of uh, pressure on automation and scalability on the ability to achieve more in terms of agility uh, in order for studios not to reach this kind of crunch where developers really hate that. It's really, you know, it's, it's, it's a thing that uh, today studios are really trying to avoid. And in order to avoid that, they need to de-risk uh, their, their efforts in order to make sure that they are kind of, they, 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 they reach in time to, to when they, they want to launch, etc. So that puts a lot of, a lot of uh, stress to their CI CD DevOps pipelines because they need to be super agile. One of, as I said, you know, there are strict release uh, dates. Another thing, it's, it's very competitive. You know, when you look at uh, games, they compete with other games for features, for graphics, etc. Uh, when you look, for example, at the metaverse, which a lot of our customers are kind of still in this race for dominating the metaverse. Uh, although it's still far, but the, the price is so big that, you know, you see a lot of investment still going on there. And, and when you look at the race, I think that one of the main characteristics of a race is in order to win it, is to be fast. That's, that's, that's a major element. So I think that when, when you look at a lot of the, the, and I'm speaking about the AAA kind of studios, the one releasing the large games, I think that speed is embedded within, you know, everything that they try to do especially in their, in their agility in their CI CD pipeline. Uh, and, and there is a good reason for that. You know, they need very high quality. Uh, gamers are not, uh, are not forgiving, you know, bugs in games that much. <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless you play, uh, play Fallout or Skyrim. Then, then you expect bugs and you love them. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. It depends on which one you encounter. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so so I we see a lot of need for speed there. So I think uh, you can see if, uh, you can see uh, 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 a lot of infrastructure tools uh, inside their pipelines. Whether things like IncrediBuild for accelerating their build and compile time and shader rendering, etc. You see a lot of uh, uh, network accelerator and and solutions for file transfer. Because once you have all the assets, it's not small assets. These are assets, you know, that have a lot of graphics with them. They need to be deployed to staging for QA, for testing. They need to then be deployed to production. But, but you, you're looking at a lot of data, a lot of assets. So that's a bit different from the regular software that you have. It's, it's, it's usually bigger than that. So a lot of optimizations there as well. And, and automation is, is, is critical, you know. Uh, they try to automate as much as they can, uh, putting a lot of effort in, in self-serve for developers to be able to have self-serve kind of environments uh, and, and very techy. So, you know, their, their developers working uh, are, are super tech, so they expect them to, they, ex they expect to have everything, you know, in their fingertips. So uh, I think that's one of the characteristics that I see uh, in their in their DevOps pipeline, I, I'm really curious to hear what the state of the art is with regard to the the sort of software development lifecycle within games. And you mentioned several things that um, you know. You, you mentioned like staging and QA, and you know so, some of these things would would sort of be yellow or red flags uh, in the places I've worked because because that usually means a slower release cycle. But but then gaming is a different beast than I'm accustomed to. I mean, I, I don't know how you would write. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure parts of games can be written with TDD, for example. But how do you how do you ensure that that ending sequence happens in the right way? With I mean, without executing it, even if it's automated, it, it takes 
60 seconds to have your, your guy jump through the right hoops and, and do the right thing. So yeah. d- can, can you just talk to us? What, what does the state of the art look like and compare and contrast that to uh, you know, more like you know, cloud-based uh, web services that, that a lot of us are, are, are programming? So I think that uh, this is a great question. And I think uh, I'm also coming from traditional software. So I think one of the things that you see which is very different than traditional software is when, and when we test traditional software, is kind of we know what the expected result of the test would be, right? We, we have A, we want to, to, the result to be B, and as long as the result is B, that's, that's what we want to have, right? So the, it's, it's very deterministic. So I can easily write, you know, automation, and everything will be automated, and all my tests, TDD, etc., cetera, uh, and, and everything, you know, can be uh, without any human touch in terms of quality. But when you're looking at the game, you know, one of the most important things is the game experience. And game experience is not something that you, you can be deterministic about. This is something that you need someone to play and kind of feel whether it has this game experience that you want to convey to your customer base, right? Whether it has the, <coughs> the kind of the feel of the game, the speed that the game would like to offer to the gamers, whether it have kind of the excitement kind of stuff that they want. And this is not something that you can, you can automate. This is something you need some people that are expert, you know, that are gamers that can give you the human element of the feedback, which is something that you don't see that much or even almost at all in, in other software releases. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know what your experience is. Well, but I, I, I think I mean, it, it, it sounds to me like you're describing UX or user experience, which of course is everything that a game is. I mean, a, a game traditional computer software has an input and produces an output. Uh, games don't. They, they they take inputs, but the the output technically is just whatever's on the screen or or in your earphones or whatever, right? Uh, it, it's the UX is the whole point. Um, but I mean, I, like to play the devil's advocate here. Um, if I were, let, let's say we're talking about, um, let's say we're talking about a uh, social media website, right? Um, you still have, there's that UX experience that still needs to be uh, pleasant and, 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 yeah. and drive engagement, mm-hmm. however you want it to do that. Um, but, but once, so, so yes, you're going to have your, your testers who like do the scrolling and they click on the links and they see there's a video pop up at the right place and is chatting pleasant and, you know, these sorts of things. But then I can still, I mean, I, I still think, you know, I think I'm sure that Facebook and LinkedIn and all those places still have tests around it. So once they decide what the chat box should look like, they put a test in place to make sure it does that. And I, I, I could imagine at least to some extent you could do that in games, you know. All right. So let's just use a game, a, a game that we all know and love, Mario. You know, we, we decided that when Mario jumps and hits the box, it should do the little dingling, whatever, and, and the coin should pop out just this way, right? So, yes, the tester spent hours playing with it to see if it did the right thing. But then once they figured out what it should be like, they could put a test in place. I don't think they did with Mario written in assembly language on a 6502, but they could have put a test in place to ensure that that that, that the little coin appeared on the screen at the right time and, you know, did the right flips, whatever. Um, and then they never have to test that aspect again. So you know, yeah. I, 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 I hear what you're saying, and, I'm, and I, I think that you're probably right that the, the, the sort of exploratory man, human testing is much heavier in something that is essentially purely UX <laughs> than it is on a social media site. But there's still elements of that in, in both. You're right. So you have both. And that's, I think that's one of the things that characterize gaming. You have both. You have both mm-hmm. the traditional software development because it's still software development. So you have unit testing, you have integration tests, you have API tests, because there are a lot of elements in games that are, you know, not even UX. You know, you have the sure. the score scorecard, you have the uh, you know uh, 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 the the user engagement, the gamer gamer engagement. You have mm-hmm. you have all this MMO, you know, uh, players kind of introducing players, etc. So there are a lot of stuff that are very traditional and there are things that are very different because when you look at, uh, so yes, the answer, Jonathan, is yes. They have also the automated test as much as they can for things that are relevant. I think that you'll you'll be surprised to see less TDD, unit tests, and all these kind of tests in games that you would expect. Uh, it's, it's a faster kind of paced uh, industry that's kind of producing more 
testing a bit less. I think there are things that, you know, when I'm speaking with the automotive market, for example, automotive industry, which is part of the industry that we are, that, that that's part of our customer base. There are things when I'm speaking with them, there are things that I'm saying that DevOps community in the automotive industry should learn from, uh, from, from gaming, but there are things that they shouldn't. You know, testing is yeah. not something I would recommend the automotive industry to learn from gaming. Uh, but I think that there, there is a reason why, you know, you need to kind of balance and, and you know, as, as a CTO, you know, I always needed to, to find the balance with the efforts that I'm putting, you know. So I think that in gaming, uh, you can, you, you have some aspects of the test, but a lot is also about the experience. And when I, when I take your example, you know, when you look at UX in, in, a, in a website, for example, then you, you will feel that, you know, that uh, it, it feels fine, you know, to work with LinkedIn, for example, or, or Netflix, and, and, uh, and it, it feels, you know, generally fine. But there are, limited thing, there are limited things that you can do in Netflix than you can do on, uh, on, 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 on some kind of open world game. Right. Uh, right. like uh, whatever, you know, that, uh, that you can play for four hours. There are so many open elements. There are so many different things that you can encounter. So many open-ended kind of scenarios that th it's limitless, you know? And, and that's different than, than regular software. You know, when, you, when you're testing regular software, I can go and kind of tell you, you listen, you've tested 85% of the software functionality. With gaming, you know, I can I can speak about the elements like the coin in the Mario that jumps or not, but whether mm -hmm. uh, how difficult it is to reach this coin, how difficult it is after I finish the previous level, how, how difficult it is after you know I, I I try to escape, how many times do I fail to do that? How does it? Uh, how how do I feel about it? You know, it's it's very different. We're speaking yeah, about yeah. Uh, psychology, emotional stuff. You know, there there are kind of the 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 feel of the game, etc. So it's it's very it's very different. But uh, both things are, are true. Also for the DevOps, you know, you have the the regular DevOps stuff. You have you know the regular CI/CD that you're familiar with, whether it's Jenkins, Azure DevOps, uh, GitHub Actions, whatever. But you also have some stuff in the pipeline that are unique for uh, for game development. Uh, you have repositories, okay. But uh, like you know, any repository that you repository that you're familiar with, but you have special repositories in the gaming, at least for the AAA, because they need to save as part of the game the assets. That's part mm -hmm. of the repository. Usually, when you look at the convention software, you have source code, you have a little more assets and things like that, and that's it. You you can use something which can you know, it's, it's a regular repository. But when you start putting gigs of assets as part of uh, versioning, you know, because it's part of versioning, you know, all these graphics are part of the game versioning, uh, then you need to have a repository, at least uh, for, the, for the huge, you know, games like Fortnite and uh, FIFAs and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. You need to have repositories that can, 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 you know, save assets which are huge and give you yeah. kind of the the ability to download these assets, move them around, you know. Uh, so again, you have the similar problems and also unique problems. And, and that, that goes with the tools and practices that, that these studios develop. Uh, we've seen that a lot in work from home, for example, where, oh, sure. where they were still expected to release games, you know, it's even more, right? We all sat yeah, there more people play. during <laughs> COVID, you know, waiting for these games to be released. Uh, they actually made it, you know. We, I think, when one of the things that we're seeing now is the games being postponed actually in 2022, and that's another topic of why they are postponed, etc. That's actually that's also part of DevOps and, and and code complexity as a whole that we see. So that's another topic. But essentially, in COVID, we expected uh, games to be even uh, faster go to market, and they needed to cope with that, you know. So I think more than other industries even. So I think that that's, that's something that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and, and it's actually very, it's, it's, it's uh, very invigorating to work with this industry because they are mm -hmm. always so fast-paced. You know, I always, when I spoke with, speak with our 
product marketing with 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 our product managers etc i always tell them you know we just lis- need to listen to our customers where they're going especially in the gaming industry we'll see the rest of the industries going as well and adopting this kind of technologies i remember you know the first gaming company telling us that they are working with containers for their ci cd where container was just you know just you know incredible this is pretty is, is there for a long time serving our customer base. So we've seen a lot of technology trends uh, going up and down, etc. So we, we've been there when the first customer came up with say, uh, listen, do you support containers as part of my CI CD? This is something that I'm going to use. And once you see a large AAA studio uh, asking for containers, you know that the rest of the market is going to follow its footsteps. So I think that's, that's part of the things that help us identify the market trends as well being part of this industry. I'm curious also to, to, to maybe finish up this topic before I move on. Um, so, so you're building a game, you're probably building it for the, the latest generation of the Xbox, maybe the PlayStation, probably PC, uh, or some subset. But generally, most games aren't built for a single platform. They're built for more, more than one platform these days. Yeah. What does that look like in your build pipeline? I mean, are, are there physical Xboxes there that you're, that you're running tests on? And yeah. how, how does that work? So yeah, so that's that's another complexity. That's an example of another complexity. So it really depends on the game, right? There are games that are uh, targeting multiple platforms. There are games that target just a specific platform. Uh, and, and according to that, the pipeline and the way that uh, developers are working with the game, it kind of, it affects that. For example, if usually when you see a game that targets multiple platforms and desktop is one of its platforms that it targets, then you'll see most of the developers working on the PC version, the desktop version of the game, testing on the desktop version of the game, running all the uh, CI CD pipeline mostly on and, on and and all the kind of automation stuff on the desktop uh, game, because it's much easier to, to create a pipeline that's on a desktop, testing a desktop application and working as a developer on a desktop application uh, then every time, you know, that I need to test, I need to build the entire pipeline for, for my consoles, for example. Uh, right. So usually they will try to do as much things as possible on the desktop side. And only when they need to test, either it's something, you know, for example, uh, either, either when they are before releases or before a major version, then they have someone also testing the game on a specific console right for experience etc another aspect is that uh, uh, performance testing you know performance tuning that needs to be done on each platform separately so do you need to have people who are expert in performance testing and tuning for playstation or for xbox or for nintendo switch etc so this is these are things that you need to do uh, uh, you know uh, explicitly uh, but it also affects the pipeline, as you said, Jonathan, because I need to build for multiple uh, multiple target platforms. Uh, each plat- target platform uh, many times require uh, their own kind of formats, whether it, these are asset formats. So you need to compress your assets for PlayStation. You need to compress your assets for Xbox. Another thing is, is architecture, you know, mm-hmm. to try and, and architect your game in a way that will allow you to have to be as much cross-platform as possible in order to for you to maintain as, as lowest code as possible, specifically dedicated for a single platform. Uh, and and part of the things that obstruct this complexity is our, our build engine, our, our, sorry, our, our game engines. For example, mm-hmm. Unreal Engine, which is, you know, the most popular game engine for AAA that's commercially available. Uh, they, they kind of abstract a lot of the complexities for you. They allow you to use one game engine to target multiple platforms, but still, you know, you still need to do your own pipeline, etc. Uh, but also, you know, one of the things in the gaming industry is that you, not everyone wants to work on the same game engine because they kind of feel that the game will look a bit similar to other games. So a lot of, mm-hmm. a lot of studios, they have their own game engines. And, 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 you know, supporting and, 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 and building a game engine, that's, that's a huge investment. And that's also part of their development investment, their pipeline investment. So it's not only that they need, you know, these 
these large, uh, it's, you know, for example, I'm, I'm just taking a specific example. EA have their, as part of their studios, they are working with their own custom Frostbite engine. It's a game engine, very complex one, serving some of the most sophisticated games and give them, the, you know, this unique look of these specific games. And they need to both maintain the game engine and all the complexities that come with it and the physics engines and the way that you bake textures and lighting and everything into your games. And in parallel, they need to develop the game itself. So it's kind of, it's more complex than just building software. Here it's kind of you build the engine on which this, with which the software is being built, but also mm -hmm. the software itself. Both of them, for example, most of the time in gaming specifically are C++ in order to give you as much speed in terms of real-time performance as possible and, and you know yeah. get the best memory and, and resource utilization etc so this is this is these are part of the complexities that this ecosystem deals with good answer thank you thank you for going into detail so you mentioned that um talking about the when talking to the automotive industry you know you wouldn't recommend that they take testing practices from the game and gaming industry <laughs> and uh, gaming is is one of a very small handful of industries that do kind of lead the way for the rest of technology so what things are you seeing now that you like if you could talk to uh, like every other more traditional devops shop what things would you tell them that they they should be looking at or in investigating to implement in their own processes? Uh, I think one is the, is not being afraid from technology innovation. I think that, you know, one of the things that I see there is they're, they are very keen to try new stuff and there are lots of new stuff. You know, I think uh, we see that uh, uh, software is, is, the, is the goal for having better quality products. You know, everyone understands that and software are being continuously developed. And I think that that's part of the things that, you know, traditional software industries, especially, you know, around embedded are less keen to try out new stuff. And that's something that I think that uh, gaming is doing a lot, game, the game ecosystem. Another thing is the, is the you know, the, the, the un, they really do everything that they can in order to be as fast as possible. And it means, you know, using distributed computing tools like Incredible to accelerate their build compilation C++ or, or rendering or whatever. It means working with the cloud, whoever can afford it in order to gain maximum scalability. It means uh, a self-serve uh, uh, infrastructure for the developers to get the fastest uh, uh, tools that they can. Uh, I think that these, these are the things that uh, we see a lot. We see a huge amount of, of investment in, 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 uh, in efficiency of the pipeline. You, you will not, I saw a lot of customers coming from uh, engineering or things like that, that are still in the nightly build kind of paradigm, you know? You will right. not see a lot of AAA game studios uh, doing nightly builds and that's it. You will see a lot of build per commit you will see, you know, you will not see uh, that many uh, integration health. You see a lot of working with branch features, you know, because they need to maintain this kind of fast paced iteration frequency. Uh, so I think these are the things that uh, a lot of the industries can, can learn from, from this industry particularly. Uh, but I think it's also, it's also important to go the other side, you know, we, uh, there was once a saying, it's not relevant that much uh, today, but uh, I don't know exactly who was it from the other side, but was someone, you know, telling uh, Bill Gates said to someone from the automotive industry, telling him, you know, if the automotive industry would progress as fast as the computer industry, we would have flying uh, cars right now. Uh, and back then, this, this automotive CEO told Bill Gates that yes, but we need to uh, restart them once in a while while we are in the air. So I think that's, uh, yeah. That was during the blue screens, you know, Windows. We don't see that many blue screens today, but yeah. still, the, you know, I need to restart my computer more frequently than I need to restart my car for malfunctioning. So I think that that's, 
and, and that's something that uh, the automotive industry, embedded industry are excel at, you know, the, having the best quality products, you know, following procedures and strict guidelines and architecture role, rules, etc., in order to make sure that, uh, you know, they have zero tolerance for, for quality, for critical issues, a lot, a lot of emphasis on security and zero trust security. That's something which uh, we see a lot now with our customers coming to us. You know, when they kind of get in the, in the automotive embedded industry, defense banks, etc., when they come and they introduce a new tool into their tool chain, like Incredible, for accelerating their their build times, uh, they want to make sure that Incredible doesn't add anything to their artifacts. Right? Do you remember Solar Wind? Was an was, a, was an, an amazing example of a man in the middle that's part of your tool chain and can you know really really make a lot of damage you know to your to your release pipeline and, and you know further down the line. So they they have a lot of them adopted zero trust security kind of if I have if I'm putting something as part of the the tool chain I need to make sure that when I'm working with or without it I'm getting the same artifact. So. Essentially, with Incredible, you can do that, but you cannot do that everywhere. But they put a lot of efforts on that. I think that in other industries, you'll see less effort. So I think that it really depends also, you know, with what you're expected to get as artifact. You know, I've seen some bugs uh, in games that if I would have seen them in my, in my car, that would have been catastrophic. Yeah, for sure. I like the idea of zero trust. Um zero trust security. Uh, can you elaborate on that just a little bit about how yeah. you accomplish that at, at Incredibuild? Yeah. So zero trust security is something that comes from the customer. You know, uh, when you're looking at the C++ ecosystem, <clears throat> you, you can find it with the largest organizations today, you know, and it's kind of characterized ecosystem. You can see it a lot of in gaming and software and CAD, CAM simulation, etc. But you can see it in also uh, industries that are very keen to security, like finance and embedded automotive, uh, uh, as a cryptocurrency, a blockchain, etc. And there you want to make sure that nothing is being injected to your final artifacts. So how can you do that, right? If, you're, if I'm using something like Incredibuild to accelerate my code, my, my compilation, just, just for us to, to understand, you know, how we can do that, essentially what Incredibuild does is it takes your C++ compilation and instead of just running it on your laptop or your CI CD node, we allow you to use all your idle CPU cycles within the organization in order to, you know, kind of have instead of just the 16 cores on your laptop, you can tap into hundreds of cores. So if your build time can finish much faster, having 300 cores instead of 16 cores, that's exactly what Incredibuild uh, provides both on-prem and scaling in the cloud or to the cloud, and also using smart caching. So it's always uh, faster not to build anything and reuse a previous artifact than building something fast. So essentially it's that. But, and, and the reason that I'm elaborating on that is because when you introduce something like that as part of your DevOps pipeline, and you have another tool that kind of touch your, your compile and build process, then this tool can potentially add additional stuff into your final artifact that you won't be aware of, right? So you want to make sure that this is not something that you can do, that, that, that software, you, you need to trust, right? Uh, so this is the trust. When, and trust is relatively easier, right? Because uh, if, if someone wants to trust Incredible, then I can, I can have... A lot of things that I can help in trust incredible, you know, our customer base, more than thousand companies, the, the, you know, our, our integration within Visual Studio, the fact that we are used within, you know, this and that industries, etc. But zero trust means that these customers are coming and they say, it doesn't matter what you're going to say. It doesn't matter even, you know, if the best security firm will have a triple A kind of vote for you. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. We have zero trust, meaning that we need to make sure from ourselves that you are really you know, not doing anything. So we, they need to have the means to make sure that they, they don't need to trust us. They can check for themselves. When you're looking at these kind of tools, 
Uh, so if, if I needed them to change their build scripts in order to work with IncrediBuild, they couldn't have tested their, their, their pipeline without me, right? Because they rely on IncrediBuild because they need to change their build script. So they cannot test it without. But with IncrediBuild, we do not need them to do that. We, 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 they keep their own build scripts, their own tool chain. We just instrument that. So essentially, they can run their same pipeline with IncrediBuild, which will run, you know, 20 minutes. And they can run their entire pipeline without IncrediBuild. Let's say it will take three hours, right? But it is still the same pipeline, one with IncrediBuild, one without IncrediBuild. And then they can compare the final artifacts. And if they see that with IncrediBuild and without IncrediBuild, they get the same final artifacts, then they can test by themselves that there is zero trust security in the way that IncrediBuild is working within their pipeline. So uh, th this is essentially, you know, a way that they can verify for themselves and not trust us saying that we are secured enough. And in order to have that, you need to have something that allow you to use your tool chain, your processes, because if I needed you to change it and use, if, I, if IncrediBuild would have been a build system, then you couldn't have tested your builds without us, right? Because you would rely on us. So that's, that's part of the things that we need to have and kind of approach to allow customers to have zero trust you know, with, with products like IncrediBuild. And that's, that's growing, you know, zero trust is growing a lot, you know, especially in, the, in these important areas like finance and, and embedded, etc. And uh, they are very prone to security. And I think that uh, we, will, we will have more than that. The IoT industry is really booming. We are expected to have billions of IoT devices all over the world. You know, everyone's going to interact with a handful of IoT devices in his day-to-day -day uh, life. And these IoT devices are really, you know, vulnerable to, to hacks. We've seen that, right? With, you know, using all these cameras, etc., to do DDoS attacks, uh, everything that's connected to Wi-Fi. So I think that uh, we, we see a lot of, of security and DevSecOps coming to uh, the customers that we are serving. I'm curious to, to hear a little bit more about, um, and, and I don't know how much this uh, really falls under your, your expertise since you're really doing uh, building. But, you know, part of DevOps is, is not just building and delivering software, but monitoring and responding to that. Um, how does that I mean? I, I, I've, I've been playing No Man's Sky again lately, and it crashes pretty frequently. And I always hit that send report button on my PlayStation. I don't know if anybody ever sees that. I mean, as far as they I know, don't. it's just go on into a dumpster <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> yeah, they have it part of their pipeline is when someone presses this button, it just goes to the, you know, to the junk. It goes yeah, to Dev you know. It just makes, you feel, it makes us feel. Us Poor losers feel better when our <laughs> system crashes. Like maybe they'll fix it. But um, do, can you, what can you tell me about uh, about that aspect, observability and, and monitoring of, of games? Since it's it's not on their server, they don't get to just like poke and prod it. They're they're depending on on uh, whatever data they might might get out in the world. Yeah, yeah. So I think that uh, that that's that's a soft area. You know that uh, that's a pain. Uh, and, and, you know, as, as you saw yourself, you can, you can send the report. Uh, did you, did someone send you a patch, Jonathan, after so, you pressed I mean, this button? Not, not, not to me, but I, I, <laughs> th they you. have been releasing patches that have caused yeah, it yeah, to yeah. crash less frequently. <laughs> yeah. And that's actually, that's what they're doing. I think that's, yeah. that's, and, and the successful game always have sequels and they have patches and they have upgrades and they need to in continuously introduce new aspects to the game, you know, the, the successful games. So that's, that's another thing that's really, you know, putting a lot of pressure into their DevOps cycles because it's not just, you know, release one product. We will go, we, if this product is successful, we are going to release a lot and very frequently, as frequently as possible because that's what generates money. It's, it generates more money than it generates with usual software where you release patches, but you don't necessarily, you know, get, uh, get revenue from them. But in the gaming, when you release a new update patch, etc., that's means to achieve more revenue. So uh, their entire DevOps pipeline, etc., and also, you know, also kind of uh, the monitoring rely on that in order for them to be able to continue improve. And, and it's not only improving. And I think that's that's another aspect of gaming. And you you specifically speak about the quality. 
But you know, another aspect of gaming is the ability to generate more revenue out of the game. So one, another thing that in games, which is a bit different, although you have it in other software, but not to this extent, is to understand how can I get more revenue out of each player, right? Why, what do I need to introduce? What kind of challenges do I need to introduce? What will appeal in my market? What kind of uh, uh, stuff you know, I can sell uh, as, as in-game accessories, etc., and people will buy? So you need to have continuous analytics, not only on the quality of the game, but also in all the areas where that really affect the revenue of the game. That's part of the art of continuously monitoring games, uh, which is a bit different than regular software. It's not just continuously tracking your bugs, etc. It's continuously being able to understand what will bring more revenue. If I'm introducing new stuff, whether people bought them, whether people visited them, whether I'm introducing new levels, how many people went to this level, how many people stayed in these levels, you know, what was interesting, what wasn't interesting. It's a bit different than a regular software. So their monitoring analytics tools are more sophisticated in a way that they don't only tackle bugs and things like that, but also all the funnel flow and pipeline of the revenue creation and the revenue generation and revenue optimization that's part of making uh, many, not all games, you know, some of the games you just buy for whatever cost it is and that's it. But many of the games rely heavily in terms of revenue on continuous improvement. And in order mm -hmm. to have continuous improvement, you need to have continuous monitoring, continuous analytics, and the ability to continuously try and offer new stuff and track how their, your, your game has responded to that. So uh, these tools are very, uh, you know, they, they are out there. There are third party tools that help you, you know, gather all these analytics, try new stuff, both for backtracking and, and et cetera, but also for revenue tracking and understanding how you can further optimize your profit from the game. It's really cool. There is so much to learn from in this industry. You know, it's really, it's really part of the software industry, but it's really also different. It has its own methodologies, pace. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's very, very interesting. So in like traditional web development, if we're, if I, if I have a landing page, you know, I'll release a couple mm -hmm. landing pages and an A-B test to see which one converts more customers. Is there a similar approach in gaming? Like, will A-B test this particular section of the game to see which one causes a user to buy more stuff? Yeah, yeah, sure. But it really depends on the game, right? Yeah. You have these mobile games where you can, we can change more frequently, and you have these games that you release them once, people downloaded them to the, their consoles, or they bought the CD, right? And the occasional patch. Uh, of course, you have A-B testing. A-B testing, you know, that's the way to test that things are actually working because before deploying it to the masses. So, but it really depends, you know, uh, on the game, uh, to which extent A-B testing can be used. You know, when you're looking at casual games, for example, uh, mobile games, there is a lot more A-B testing than in console games, which is more complex uh, to, to kind of get this fast loop of A-B testing, but they are used everywhere. But if you look at casual, mobile, uh, you'll see a lot, a lot of that there. And, and part of the flow is to actually be able to introduce all these kind of new scenarios very, very frequently. When you're looking at these large mobile studios, one of the main things that they invest in is that their ability to iterate fast and introduce new uh, uh, revenue streams to their products by testing them and seeing whether they work or not. Uh, that's actually part of their DevOps. It's, and there is a person who is responsible for introducing new stuff in order to generate more revenues. That's, that is part of the DevOps process and then analytics and is using A-B testing, etc., in order to make sure that uh, more revenues can be generated and the way to efficiently generate them. So the answer is definitely yes. Oh, that's super cool. That's actually one of the things that I like about DevOps a lot is where you can tightly align with the business and like be closely integrated with the, the wheels that actually move the business forward. Yeah.
I think one of the things that is changing in the game industry is in favor towards that trend. You know, one of the things, the, one of the dramatic changes in gaming that's coming up is actually not the metaverse, which is, which will probably take more time till we, we, we have, you know, what we foresee as a metaverse. But one of the trends in gaming is the, is the cloud streaming games, right? It's all the ability that instead of uh, installing the game on my PC, I can have a service like uh, PS Now or, or, or Xbox Live or whatever, and I can stream the game and play it uh, without downloading and installing it on my computer. Uh, there, there was, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with, with Google Stadia. Uh, Google Stadia is an, is an engine uh, the, for, from Google that was supposed to be the new kind of thing in cloud uh, game. Uh, uh, engine kind of building, you know, cloud uh, game streaming, uh, and they shut down the project, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but I think that but the trend still continue. And once we'll see this trend uh, continue more and more, uh, we will have more the ability to, to, to the, the, the students will have the ability to uh, act more as, you know, in a SaaS software than as they have today, because they will be able to have more control over the game that is being streamed to the developer than a game that you purchase, you know, on a store, on a CD and install to your PlayStation or Xbox, right? So this entire industry is going towards a uh, kind of service, game as a service, games as a service kind of thing or model. So, uh, and, and that is going to make it more, uh, come more cl close to the kind of SaaS uh, web, web apps, things, model that we know of that allow more monitoring and more flexibility uh, in that perspective. And the main reason that uh, cloud streaming, is a uh, game cloud streaming is, 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 is that trend and we're going to see the entire industry moving towards that direction is because it brings the, the AAA games. Currently, you know, you need to have either a very strong desktop or a console in order to play these AAA games. And that reaches you know, only 300 million players can have this kind of hardware for to allow them to play these AAA games. But when I'm streaming these games, I can play the same game on my TV, on my mobile, on my on my tablet, etc. So instead of having only 300 million players, gamers potential, now these studios will have 2.7 billion gamers as potential players. That means nine times more gamers than they had before. So the entire industry is kind of tapping into this amazing market. And we see this not only from the gaming uh, production side, but also from the electronic consumer electronic side. If you've seen the, the previous consumer electronic uh, shows, you see a lot of these coming to TVs and remote controls and kind of handheld devices, all these things, uh, investment in, in cloud streaming. That's going to be something that we'll see a lot of in this in this upcoming decade. That's just taking like cloud computing to a, a whole new level, you know, because we've tried yeah. it in a few different instances with um, like, uh, like Amazon has their cloud nine web-based development environment and, and VS Code has some cloud type environment. We've seen desktop apps like Microsoft Office. Now, I don't think you can even get it on a download, but you'll use Google Docs, which is all web-based. And now it's just going to to gaming, which is sort of similar, but like the compute and the, the performance characteristics are completely different. Yeah, yeah. And again, uh, you know, as, as all the previous examples, again, you have this similar and, and different in, in how game uh, streaming look like uh, versus other kind of streaming. For example, if we compare game streaming to Netflix, right? When, you're, when I'm streaming video, I'm just streaming video one way, right? The, I know, you know, that's the start of the movie. That's the end of the movie. Nothing's going to change. It's going to be the same movie, whether I'm playing that, uh, you play that will or, or Jonathan play that, right? It's going to be the same movie. If the three of us are going to play a game, it's going to be a different game for each of us, right? So the streaming of a game is different, right? It needs to, the streaming is related to the way that I interact with it, which is different than when I'm streaming a Netflix movie. In a Netflix movie, I can forward, rewind and pause. That's it, right? With a game, I can move 
right, I can move left, I can jump, I can do a lot of stuff. And then the game needs to, so it's a lot of about upload and the ability to, one of the things that you see in, in streaming is that they stream the next five minutes of the movie ahead of time, mm -hmm. right? But in gaming, you cannot do that as you, know, as you can do that because I don't know what you're going to do in the next five minutes. So the complexities there are much more meaningful than anything we are seeing in other industries. Again, again, you see you know, the, the similarities and the differences you know, that this industry and complexities offer. So game streaming is, is there. It has a lot of complexities. Not everything is solved yet, uh, but that's where we're heading. And, and Jonathan mentioned, you know, the SDKs, you know, the ability to work and test things, you know, in the, another thing that comes up, you know, till now, the developers worked on SDKs, they worked on their console, everything was needed to be developed, to be developed on PlayStation, you needed to have a PlayStation in order to test things and, you know, develop near the PlayStation, copy your game to the PlayStation and test it there, etc. And one of the things that uh, as part of the cloud transition that we're seeing is, is that, uh, that these game SDKs are going to be offered as part of a cloud native development experience. That's, that's something that we'll see this decade uh, uh, coming up as well. And, and this, the, the gaming ecosystem development is, is actually waiting for that because it's going to uh, uh, remove a lot of the bottlenecks of moving files back and forth from my desktop compiling to my console uh, and, and waiting it for there, and then starting the game there. It's a, a lot of complexities, and these, these, these kind of people don't have time to waste. So uh, I think that once we'll see cloud SDKs for gaming, that's, that's another kind of, uh, the next kind of phase that we'll see of, of game development transitioning to the cloud. So I, I hate to burst your bubble, but I've been streaming games for decades. I, I, I used to be a mud player back on my Commodore 64 with a 300 baud modem. <laughs> I'm sure this is just like that. It's exactly the same. You know, it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a bit more complex today. I, actually, it, it brings us back to the... To the one of the things that we've seen, we spoke about COVID. You know, one of the things that we've seen in 2022, and that's also related to DevOps, is that a lot of games have been postponed, a lot. You know, uh, release dates, and that was the year with the most postponed games that we ever seen in the industry. And one of the reasons for that is that games became more and more complex. You know. Uh, uh, it's, it's really complex. The game engines became more complex. The game itself, the demand from the customers, the quality, the cross-platform, all this kind of stuff, uh, you know, caused a lot of delays in gaming. It was also related to COVID and the time it took the game industry to cope with work from home, you know, with all this network transfer, etc., which makes it more complex. But I think that, you know, that's, that's where DevOps is, you know, in order to allow us all this automation DevOps practices, agile practices, uh, they are here in order to allow us not to miss our deadlines, right? Incredible is here in order to help our customer the risk from not meeting their deadlines, right? And still, uh, these are very, very capable studios uh, with, with the best people, you know, best software developers out there, uh, but still many of them are missing their deadlines and, and that means a lot, you know, of the of the amount of uh, journey that we still have, you know, in DevOps, in agility, in order to make sure that when we think that we are going to release something, uh, we are actually going to meet the the, the deadline that we we, we gave. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's part of, you know, I, I currently I'm not managing the R&D anymore. So lucky for me, I don't need to meet these deadlines. But uh, <laughs> when I did, you know, you don't want to be there. You don't want to be and come to get, tell your CEO, listen, we need to postpone the game by six months. That's not something you want to, I, wa I don't want to be in the shoes of someone that needs to do that, you know, with an investor, etc. So the riskifying, investing in DevOps, investing in productivity tools, in, in acceleration, acceleration tools, etc. That's part of the ways to avoid uh, missing your deadlines. And I think we see that. We see, we see the understanding into that as well. Cool. Well, let's move on to picks then. 
Jonathan, getting picks? Yeah, I've got a couple picks for this week. Um, I just started listening to an audio book that I'm, I'm really enjoying. It's depressing, though, so take that uh, with a grain of salt, I guess. It's called The Man Who Broke Capitalism. How Jack Welch gutted the heartland and crushed the soul of corporate America. And how to undo his legacy. <laughs> so I, I remember reading a book that he wrote. I think it was called Straight from the Gut uh, several years ago when I had a boss who just worshipped this man. So I, I read the book to kind of try to understand my boss better or understand understand thy enemy, as they, as they say, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I read the book and I thought, this is kind of interesting. But, you know, I, I don't know. I, I didn't really agree with a lot of it. And, and this, this book is really opening my eyes to a lot of the stuff that uh, – that that, that 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 book talked about and just other you know quote kind of history lesson about corporate america uh in the corporate world in, in general but specifically in america but but also worldwide so it's, it's a good book so far i don't yet know how to undo his legacy or i would be doing that but maybe at the end of the book i'll, I'll know the answer did you try command z <laughs> i did i did <laughs> okay. i just got a blue screen <laughs> gotcha <laughs> uh my second pick um is going to be a, a a tool that uh a, a a friend slash uh, col- colleague uh, of mine wrote. Uh, so he's he's the co-organizer of the the Go Amsterdam uh, meetup with me and a few others. So does that make us colleagues? We don't work together, but I, I, we're, we're colleagues. We're volunteer colleagues in this meetup group, right? Uh, so he recently released a, a tool called Mox, M-O-X. Uh, and it's a sort of, it's kind of a cool project. It's, a, it's an all-in-one mail server it does smtp it does imap it does spf dkim dmark uh tls uh uh acme slash let's encrypt uh keys all this stuff in a single binary uh so you can easily host your own mail server and he's asking for people to try it out and and uh and play with it i thought that's that's great for this audience you know if you haven't ever hosted your own mail server you probably should just so you know what it's like and you know how terrible (laughs) it is (laughs) (laughs) and and if you do that and you're like man this is fun i like this pain but i wish it was easier then mox is probably for you (laughs) so so go check that out it's a a github.com slash mjl dash slash mox and i i had him on my youtube channel boldly go to talk we did a sort of a code review of of that so if you're interested you can find that on youtube uh on the boldly go channel uh but yeah check out mox it's a cool cool project Right on. And that was a, a mail server, M A I L, not yeah, M-A-L-E. Yeah. Right. I, I know that the confusion there, you know, there's a lot of confusion there, but in, yeah. Yeah. M A I L, S M T P, that sort of mail. <laughs> That's why I'm here, it's for the bad jokes. Yeah. <laughs> Dory, what about you? You got any picks for us this week? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, just after trying to assemble my first uh, mailbox, you know, mail server, you know, I think that uh, my pick is uh, is, a, is a book. Uh, well, besides uh, software development, I'm uh, I'm practicing and teaching Zen Buddhism. Oh, right on! So for all of you, yeah. So and I'm really I'm really into that. I think that's that's an amazing thing for you to do in order to get a lot of a lot of a lot of joy. And, and and fulfillment into your life. So I will I will pick something from this. You know, maybe it will do someone good. So I would I would consider Ellen Watts, the way of Zen. Ellen Watts is a, is a writer. It was a writer. You know, introduced Zen Buddhism to the U.S. back there in the 60s, 70s. And he's a great teacher. I think he he has a, he was a theologist and and kind of has a very nice way. To introduce Zen to Westerners, uh, so I really recommend Zen Buddhism in general, and Alan Watts' writing in particular to go into this topic. And I think that uh, as software developers, you know, I'm I'm really you know, I was always looking into things that I can try myself. You know, I'm I'm not into I don't consider it spirituality. So I needed something that I can really taste and you know understand, etc. So I think that that's, that's actually a relevant philosophy for, for target audience we, we are speaking uh, with. Uh, so I really recommend, you know, go and, and check this out. That's really working. Right on. Yeah, agreed 100%. So my pick, since we're talking about gaming today, I'm going to 
go back to one of my favorite games, and it's a few years old now, but the it, the Half-Life series, the latest game of Half-Life, Alex is available on the Oculus VR. So it, it's a VR game and it's just an amazing game. If you haven't played it, I highly recommend it. It's Alex, A-L-Y-X, because the, like we were talking about, the user experience is just so well done in this game. You put on the headset and you completely lose track of the fact that you're not <laughs> in this world you know like like i'll be playing and and the dog will come in and and touch my leg or something it's like oh shit what the <laughs> oh wait it's a real life dog never mind <laughs> it's just that well done so it's not a snark <laughs> no <laughs> but it has you thinking for a few seconds <laughs> so that's my pick for the week um dory if people want to get in touch with you to learn more about this or follow you on social media how can they do that yeah, my LinkedIn, uh, always welcome, Dory Exterman. Uh, text me uh, and, and I'll answer. I'll be more than happy to chat. All right, cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank this you. was a this pleasure. was a cool conversation. Very insightful. It really was. Thanks for coming. Yeah, right on. Thanks, and we'll see you all yeah. next week.